so lots I want to chat about with Japan, but you went to school in Castlenock and you have an Aussie accent. So talk to me about, uh, <laughs> about that time. Yeah, I am a mongrel. I was born in Dublin, but my parents are from Wicklow. Um, and when I was one, we migrated to Australia. So I grew up in Perth um, until I was 14. And then uh, through homesickness, my mum and dad both lost their parents. We decided to migrate back to Ireland. Um, so that became home again and it was very disruptive. We weren't, I, after a year, wanted to get back to Australia, didn't know any difference. So um, had I not found Castanock College, I probably would have tried to board in Australia longer term. But I started in a local school, then found Castanock College and settled back in. And my parents have never left. They've, they've stayed there since. Um, but at 14, moved back, finished high school at Castanock College, went into the Leinster Academy and went to uni at DCU. And then uh, it was about that time Leinster were under Michael Checker. They were flat out trying for that first star, had signed huge internationals. Um, and again, I played all my age grade and rep stuff alongside Keen Healy. And again, he fast tracked, he jumped the beat and got in. And there just didn't seem like there was a pathway at that time for me. So I took a gamble and went to Exeter. I went and played in the championship with Exeter and then found, again, got some games, got some exposure at that level, but always had an inkling to go back to Australia with an Australian passport. And I got an offer to go back to the Brumbies. Um, after two years with Exodus, I played the first year in the championship, won promotion, and then played that second year through the premiership and our first exposure to Europe. And then went out to the Brumbies and played Super Rugby and got back into Australian life. So an absolute cool. mongrel. And yeah, yeah, no, cool. And so when you are in Castlenock, did you board there at that time? Yep, I was a boarder. So not seven days, like we were probably six day boarders because you'd always have rugby on Saturday. So I'd stay through to Saturday and try and get home most weekends. Um, my, again, my family dynamic, my dad retained a business in Australia after we migrated. So he commuted back and forward. So it was always nice to get home and make sure that we were always together when we could. Yeah. But no, I boarded. And is that when you kind of decide that rugby is something that you wanted to do properly? Like I'm sure you're training full on there. Yeah, obviously like the intensity of rugby picked up and I was um, into it. So I actually have a different background. I, growing up in Australia, played representative baseball. Um, I played at a state and national baseball. level at an, in Australia. And when I went back to Ireland, had been told that a group of Americans had started or established a national baseball league in Ireland. And that an Irish national team were actually attempting to qualify for the Olympic Games. Um, that team was made up of a lot of expat Americans at maybe uni level or semi-pro level who were never going to play for America but had an attachment to Ireland and were pretty keen to come over and have an experience. Um, so to be honest, until I was 17, I chased elite baseball. Um, and I the, that culminated at 17. I went to a Major League Europe catchment camp, having played for Ireland in an Olympic qualification and uh, got an offer to go to America. But again, we had had family friends with poor experiences. What it looked like, we probably couldn't guarantee. So we decided to stay in Ireland. And honestly, the day that we turned it down, everything went to rugby. And then all of a sudden, my last year became Leinster schools and potentially Leinster under 19s into Irish schools, uh, under 19 World Cup at that point. Like, it was honestly like the day I let go of it, I decided that I really, really liked rugby outside of just training and playing. And uh, rugby probably became at 17 became my main focus. Wow. And so what um, position did you play like in baseball? Mm, I was a catcher. Yeah. So I, yeah, in behind, try to call shots. Okay. And like physically, like how is that? So uh, yeah, you're not running around as much, are you? No, it, like obviously has its own um, 
physicality to it, but not a not so much running and athletic and otherwise. Mm. Cool. And then, so you, yeah, decided to kind of call that and then all in on rugby. And was it all yeah. in as in like you started looking at Leinster and looking at getting involved in pathways? No, honestly, I didn't look at it. It kind of just happened naturally. I was playing well. Like I made this SC, I mean, you're reasonably familiar with Irish schools, but I made the SCT in fourth year, fifth year and sixth year. Um, probably just a lack of players initially and I was big enough and uh, probably physically capable enough to mix it at that point. Probably lacked enough skill and got found out a little bit. But um, So I'd had enough experience, had got a bit of exposure um, and then in that sixth year was put into those capturing groups for Leinster, went through the trial system, et cetera, and just, it just seemed to keep going. You know, I just seemed to be able to keep kicking on. And how did you find... Uh... How did the baseball help your rugby or was there anything that kind of played over there? Really hard to know other than, you know, I reckon as a grounding for young people, just any skill, I wouldn't limit yourself to sport. Like I reckon just skill, uh, tactical understanding, you know, learning the way the shapes of games look and how you can cheat within them, play play your own way within them. Um, especially in the position I played, I probably had a better tactical awareness of the game young than a lot of people had. Um, but no, probably just, again, general skill. Like how do you, you learn to catch, master a skill? How do you practice it? How do you get better at it? Probably just the general, uh, pedagogy of it probably helped me in the transfer. Yeah. And so mm. then after school, was it straight into Leinster Academy? Yeah. Uh, no, I did the, again, the Leinster Academy being what it was, we did a year in the sub academy. Yeah. So we left school and were put into that uh, sub academy tier. Like that was stacked. That was that had a lot of really good footballers in it. Um, we had won the under nine again the Inter Pro series. We had won. We went to the Irish under nineteen World Cup. So the world under the World Cup under nineteen in Dubai had played reasonably well as a group, and then we went into that under twenty system for the first time that following year altogether. And we were the first under twenties to win that Grand Slam, that same group. So we were all in the sub academy, trying to get through the sub academy into academy that year. And mm. so then, when you're in the academy, you just decide. Did you decide yourself? Like you, you look forward and just said at that young age, like, "Hey, I want to develop more, and I'm not going to do it next to Keen Healy." Was that it? Uh, Honestly, I don't know. I th again, probably just being aware, I, I was really, I always wanted to play. That was my biggest thing. I knew I was training hard, um, but I, I wanted to definitely get exposure at the next level. And again, I don't know if I was, you know, hindsight's brilliant and I'm a bit older now and whatever, but I don't know if I was running away from the problem that I couldn't get in at Leinster and could have, should have hung around and stuck it out and see if I could have made it happen or whether taking the gamble was worth it because the exposure I got at Exeter as a full-time professional, not juggling uni and juggling, you know, having to get out my own feet, I was on my own, uh, whether that set me up to go to Australia and kind of give it a really good crack and whether that opened up everything else. So I can't, I couldn't tell you other than I just, I knew I probably had the ability to go. I thought I had the ability to play at that level and I, I couldn't see it happening as quickly as I want it to happen. That debate around whether I ran away from it at Leinster or went and got it, I'm not sure. Yeah, and so did you kind of seek that out yourself? Did you have an agent or like how did... Yeah, um, I had an agent. Happen? Again, I think most players these days can find representation pretty easily, but I did have an agent um, and he... I told him I would potentially look if there was something for me. Like I had played international in the twenties. I had a little bit of a CV, had some good footage from those games, from some Leinster A games at that point. Like I had a little bit of footage that I could show people and was happy to go over and do a, interviews or medicals or whatever. And Exeter popped up and he said, listen, this is a, this club's going places at that point. Everyone knew about them in the championship. They were making moves towards premiership football. And yeah, it was honestly, it was too good an opportunity. Yeah, cool. And I've heard so, so much about Exeter and Rob Baxter and like all that they've done there, like yeah. starting at that time. But what was it? What was it like in that club? 
uh, I reckon probably what you're still seeing today was established when I was there. All they've done has been so true, so true to it, and probably just continued to top up the playing group with the right players who embody what they want. If there's one thing I know, they've probably got they've got a culture and an established like it's an established culture, but it's an established type of human that they require to play Exeter football. And like part of that is also you've got to embody Exeter. Like if you play for the Chiefs, you've got to live and breathe Exeter. Like that is a part of the world. And you get it back. Like if, you, if you're if you all in, you'll get it back or all in there as well. Um, so, yeah, one of the best places I ever played. Great place to live. Uh, the football is excellent. They train hard. They play hard. They know how to enjoy themselves. Uh, it's no so yeah. Again, they were successful while I was there. It's no surprise they're successful now. And when you say the kind of type of person that they bring in, like you say, culture there, it's something that you hear a lot thrown around, like the word yeah. now. But um, yeah, like what kind of, what was do you feel was expected of you? What made a kind of an extra Chiefs player or person? Mm. First of all, you're really disciplined. So they work, like I said, they work real hard. So the S and C side of the program was uh, run by ex-military. So it was really organized, it was highly diligent, it was note-taking, uh, a standard was set and breaking the rules led to punishment, not for just flogging's sake, but just to a discipline of small things that mattered there. Um, I thought that Rob Baxter was probably ahead of his time in terms of how he thought about the game, potentially learned from other sports and just, and again, it's only now that I'm a coach, I look back and see how he potentially thought about even how to warm up like does playing 10 minutes of nfl while it looks fun and stuff is there something he's seen in that drill to open up vision and understanding of this or again you can just read it as it it's, it doesn't or it's just some way to warm up for 10 minutes but i hadn't seen it before that um so there was a discipline to a standard I thought he had a really clear vision of the game that was probably ahead of people. He brought in someone in Ali Hefer who's still there with him, who probably could take Exeter to the next level in terms of an attack structure, uh, back play and stuff. And we probably had a group initially that were, were ready with some new, with some premiership players coming back to the championship level to help promotion. Um, that group was ready to go. The culture side, again, you just, like I said, it's black and white. This is who you're expected to be. You're allowed to be individual, but these are the markers that an extra chief hits. And then you buy in, you're all in, you work hard. Um, yeah, very oh, good. It was a great yeah. place. And then was it two years there and then back to Australia, back home? Yep, I got the offer to go out to Australia and, and play with the Brumbies. And seemed to have a good run there. I... Again, I've gone back there a second time as a coach this time, which was never in my pathway initially, but it's a special place. Yeah, it's, um, I've got a brother who works there now. Like my whole family are attached to the place. It was, it's special. It's um, probably like the Chiefs, more hard to describe other than like once you're a Brumby, I think you understand Canberra and you understand the Brumby and you're stuck with it for life. You can't get away from it. And what would you feel was the best period of your career, like playing-wise? Like, when did you have the best, yeah, yeah those most, three, most enjoyable? Those three years at Brumbies, in hindsight, were my best. Um, I then, obviously, from Brumbies, got an offer to, got chased with an offer to come back to Ireland. And um, being Irish qualified, that was simple. Like, it wasn't a foreigner, but it had super rugby experience. Um, it was a good money offer. Again, it was it was far better than what I was getting paid in Australia and Super Rugby, which isn't hard. Um, that was again, had it gone well, it would have been a great decision. But had the decision to leave Brums and how much I was embedded in, loved the place, friends, uh, like I had met an Australian girl, everything. That was yeah, I shouldn't have left that period. Yeah, and so I suppose is it. You just saw like a bigger opportunity, like, you know, a, 
tend to go back. Definitely. I remember, I remember that time, like there, there wasn't as many in Ireland, wasn't it? You know, no, there wasn't. Mike Ross was yeah. there and it, there was a lot of talk about how we need more props in Ireland. Yeah. And so did you just see a kind of big opportunity there to- I think that was probably the part of the push initially to get me back is let's put another one in the system and let's just see, I, I imagine so. Um, and again, look, I'm, I, I'm Irish, I'm Australian, whatever. I'm really proud of both. So the opportunity to potentially play for Ireland uh, get home and spend some genuine time with my mum and dad, see my brother, see some childhood friends. Like it was really attractive, albeit up the road in Belfast, but we were, it was close. It's a lot closer than Canberra. Um, so the whole thing was attractive. That that was the reason to come back. Yeah, and it's something interesting you say there. But uh, I uh, grew up in Connacht. I'm a big Connacht mm. fan. Played underage there, and I heard Bundy Aki saying recently how there's always been talk about him leaving or you know there always is these rumors or whatever and he said that he's playing great rugby there he loves it why would he leave and it's it's kind of you do always think the grass is always green i've been there myself i've moved around to different places but um just for young players listening i just heard that and then the way you're saying as well like mm-hmm. mistake to leave but um yeah like what would you say to a young player if you know they're they're playing somewhere and enjoying it, but I don't know mm. other opportunities are elsewhere. It's, it's a difficult yeah. one, isn't it? It definitely is. Like, what is it? The grass isn't always greener, but sometimes it is greener. And I don't know, like mm. you say Bundyaki, like I coached Mac Hansen, who's obviously thriving in Ireland, like, but we couldn't get Mac into the Brumbies team. But I was coaching Mac, had him through the Australian under 20, Junior Wallaby program, had him through the, uh, Brumby's Pathways program, super talented, was always going to be a super rugby player, definitely. Question marks over him at international level. But we couldn't get him into the Brumby's team. Uh, he's got a genuine offer to go and play. I'm sure Connick had an offer that sounded like everything I got offered. But his grass is green. Though. Like He has thrived. Mm. Just signed a big contract, playing for Ireland. Everyone's talking about him. And again, he was the same player we had. We just... The dynamic was different, so that decision for a young player is amazing. Like, couldn't be prouder for him. But I think he left. He left with the right intention at the right time. Like it was, the scenario was good. Yeah, and why couldn't you get him into the Brumbies team? Again, like there's there's Wallabies ahead of him. There was people who potentially the style we we were after potentially could execute that style. Like, uh, I don't know how familiar you are you are with the Brumbies, but you look at like the left winger is Andrew Muirhead. Andrew Muirhead was a club player in Australia. Couldn't break into the red system. The Brumbies brought him down. Exciting, exciting youngster, like tough, not big. But like he's just re-signed again with the Brumbies. And he starts on the left wing habitually because he embodies exactly the way they want to play and can deliver it. Can't do what Mac can do, like can't run off a kickoff, catch it at full speed, put it down. At the yeah. Like he won't do that. But what he will do is deliver Brumbies rugby every week. And sometimes it's it's all context. Like Mac is the right player for the right team. And everything that he learned at Brumbies, uh, professionalism, how to operate in a team, team first, habits around how he plays, his everyday, that's what's making him a good footballer now in the right place. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? How like different mm. environments or different teams, and like he's the perfect player for Connacht. Like the way they play, couldn't be better. It's just yeah. Like even like Jack McGrath when he went to Ulster was the best loose at Nile. And I know yeah. through injury and through a number of other things, but like he's off the face of the earth at the moment. He was a fantastic player. Just yeah. context just doesn't work whether it's decision, yeah. luck, whatever, sometimes it's just not always greener, but sometimes it is definitely greener. Yeah, it's an interesting one. And it's so different, like super rugby, Irish rugby, like uh, it's just everyone knows it. It's a different, it's a completely different game. Ireland it, and UK versus, game. yeah. And how did you find that? Was it a kind of shock um, for you stepping back? Yeah, I mean, like I said, the, the design of the game is the same, right? But it's just whether, 
how many games you played, size of squads. It's, it is a different product really once you get back. I think my biggest, so I finished with the Brums. I just played my last seven games as a hooker because of an injury crisis. Um, and then I had a couple of days after we lost in Sydney, had a couple of days to pack up everything, got back into Ireland, said hello to my family and was in Ulster. And I was, we, they were obviously late in the prep given when I arrived. And I was back playing loose head and I could not believe I was back in like heavier ground, massive pack. Like mm. I could not believe it just felt like slow. It was heavy. I was playing catch up real early in that quick transition period. Again, the second year was better. I felt more equipped. I had done a full preseason and with Ulster and felt ready to go. But the style initially definitely caught me out. Yeah. And probably as well, like, the body shape and conditioning for mm. I would imagine for like a prop in super rugby like a loose head prop in super rugby versus a, a f- loose head yeah. in in Ireland is is probably quite different is it yeah well again I probably got caught out in that I probably naturally suited the super rugby game like running capacity and stuff was always good um and was able to compete in the super rugby demands comfortably when I got back and that slower, again, that heavier, more nutritional style, it, get, it used to take me away. I couldn't get my breath. It was, a, it was a different demand system than I'd been using for a long time. It was very interesting, actually. You, you're spot on. Yeah. And then what second season was it towards the end of that, that um, you got an injury, an injury to yeah. your hand? So my first season there, again, I was late to the piece. Um, came in and then did okay initially. And then I, what did I, do first? I had like a, a small calf that, or something that didn't go well, which slowed me down, got back to playing, was playing in the AEL. And I, I thought I had just dislocated my finger, um, but it was, it was, it was significant. Um, it needed full reconstruction and I had that done. Um, rehab that got back and then did a full preseason. It was going well. And then not long into the second season again, the reconstruction completely broke. Again, I was just catching a football and I hit right on the wrong spot and uh, I had to go and have it done. But they do a joint fusion the second time. And that was, yeah, that was it. Like the season was gone again. It's crazy. And so then I read in the thing that you couldn't, like you couldn't grab. Yeah, like it's a small, I still I still can't. So I've got a, that, that finger there is fused. And obviously as oh, part okay. of the grip, that obviously makes up a fair part of it. So I've got a lot of, not much function through here, through that bottom part of the hand. But it's good at a certain, at a certain, like I can do this, or oh, that's fine. Just at that real small tensile part, it was, it was poor. Yeah. And the joint itself was so fresh because it's a, a new fused joint. Any touch of contact, it would swell. The pain was pain was yeah, very different, strange. Yeah, so then you had to call it a day. Well, yeah, like at that point, the two years hadn't gone well. I was dealing with this and I had just lost like, my passion to what I was always good at. I reckon if I was going to ever summarise me as a player, I reckon I was as good as anybody Monday to Friday. I just could never make Saturdays happen the way I wanted consistently enough. And when I was real good Monday to Friday and I probably wasn't getting the highs on the Saturdays or Sundays or whenever the game fell, it was getting harder to back up Monday to Friday when I couldn't see. Again, your reward system is winning games, playing games, winning games. And when I wasn't getting that consistently enough, it was getting harder and harder to stay true to myself Monday to Friday. And at, at some point, I just decided, like, I would rather, again, at that point, I would rather go and make coffee and be happy than keep pushing Monday to Friday for no reward. Like, oh, I'm actually okay with that. So if nothing comes up now, I'm not going to be staying here. So if nothing comes up, I'm, I'm happy. And I didn't even know at that point if the hand would allow me to play. Yeah. And why do you think it was that um, that you couldn't, on a Saturday, get get to where you want to be yeah again now that i'm coaching i've, I've, I've given it some thought but I'm, ha- I'm happily moved on from the playing days but 
uh, I'm not sure. Like, again, being good Monday to Friday is the easy part, I reckon. So, again, I don't know at the top end. Did And, again, because I finished there, I was going really well at, at Brumbies and they wanted me to stay when I did leave. Had I not left, it may have been completely different. Like, I was in the team there playing super rugby. Like, things were good. So the decision for me was poor, like we, in terms of young players leaving. I wasn't old when I left. I was only twenty. I was only twenty-five when I went to, to Ulster. So I was still still good. Yeah. Hmm. And so, a number yeah. of things probably. Like I don't know if I put enough into doing the small things, but then I always look back and say, like I did work hard. Tried to, like I would. My personality, I'm all in. So if I'm a Brumby, I'm a Brumby. I tried to get into the Ulster spirit. Um, yeah, really hard. Hard to know. Yeah. And so you decided to do that, go back and make coffee in Australia, was it? Set up a cafe. Yeah, again, I had through the Brumbies, um, my wife's from Canberra. So we had an instant connection to go back to Canberra. Loved our life there. Had, um, had connections in the coffee industry. Had a job ready. If I if I ever wanted to pull the trigger, I had a job ready to go. So I just decided let's <clears throat> let's go. I wanted to get back into Australia and just jumped headfirst at it. Yeah, I think three or four days after getting into Australia from retirement, I was pulling coffee. Nice one. How was that? That was good. I was. It gave me everything I wanted initially. Definitely a learning curve, but um. Yeah, I was happy. Like I was just going to the gym just to keep myself ticking over or doing whatever I wanted. You know, all the little things like just being able to have a beer when you want. Didn't miss friends' weddings. Uh, didn't miss parties. Didn't have to. Yeah, it was a different life. It was good. Yeah. And mm. so, yeah, it's a side that people don't see, I suppose. The, like you say, they're mi- missing friends' weddings, missing these different things, you know, yeah. the, all the sacrifices. And so just kind of towards the end, it was just you, you kind of realised you weren't happy, really, was it? Definitely. What, like I said, the game, I wasn't – professional sports, fucking hard. It's hard. And it, if you want to do it properly, it requires sacrifice. And, um, like, you've got to be so diligent to do it properly. And I, like I said, I thought Monday to Friday I was really good but I could not get the ultimate return from the game, which is to play and win. I wasn't getting that feedback. So it kept causing me to question like Monday to Friday, how do I keep getting up for this? How do I be true to myself and then not get the return? Like that didn't, that didn't seem right to me. Yeah, so was, fair play. I knew then. I was happy with the decision. I knew. Yeah, that's brilliant. And then uh, the itch came back, did it after a while in the cafe to kind of get back involved? Uh, so, listen, when I, the club team I was affiliated, affiliated to in Canberra saw me back, I had a friend involved there. He asked would I, was I interested in coming to help do anything? Uh, I said, yeah, yeah, I suppose I can come and have a look, whatever, I'd just go and connect with everyone again and say hello. I had a little, started helping the Colts team out who needed a little bit of help got instant gratification for some simple things that I knew would work, like not hard, but just simple things. And then saw the feedback again, it was attached to a game. You don't love, you don't do rugby at this level if you're not into it. Like it's definitely, you've got to love the game. So the itch to the game, it was just interesting. I had no intention of coaching. I actually wanted to pursue, while I was doing the cafe, was really keen on becoming a, a team manager at super rugby level, now team manager is probably, it's beyond logistics at super rugby level. It's, um, you're the crossover between business and football programs on top of logistics, uh, working with the head coach in terms of how, it was, it was a really attractive role. And I thought given my personality, I had a degree in business, given my understanding of rugby, I thought, I would go through a pathway scheme to try and get that job. It's what I really wanted to do. Um, but the actual model in Australia changed to a GM and a manager. So that role didn't exist anymore. So the GM became uh, highly focused on recruitment, contracting, and more of a legal role attached to rugby. And the manager just became a logistics role. So that it became less attractive and I'd started coaching, so I was happy. 
Mm. And what was it about the coaching that you kind of got happy, got feedback and started Honestly, enjoying it pretty quickly? Again, I think it, it was that feedback loop, like I said, like all of a sudden I was able to be part of the, a part of the Monday to Friday. Mm. But as a coach, you know you're playing on Saturday. So I didn't have the anxiety around, fuck, am I getting picked? How am I going to play on Saturday? Like, it definitely, I cared, and I still, to this day, I care too much about how the weekend goes. Like, again, my, like you've already, I've told you, like, my, my biggest problem with, as a player was that the anxiety around that feedback loop on Saturdays wasn't good for me. So the reverse now as a coach, like, one of my, not a mantra, but one thing I've always said as to why I coach is I want players to have good weekends. That's that's why I do what I do. That's why I'm doing. I want you to have good weekends, and if I get that right, but the the downside of that is how invested I still am to the result and how things go on the weekend, which is it's my best and probably worst trait. I take I still take it far too personally, but it, it always bodes well for me if I'm like that. Yeah. And so, and so again, coaching coaching gave me that feedback loop. Yeah, it's so interesting to say that. Like. Uh, I started understanding myself very recently with the mm. like caring too much and yeah it's kind of like the more you care like about those outcomes on a Saturday the more you tense up and the more the kind of anxiety that comes in around it and you start building it up lots and Monday to Friday you can get busy in your work and put your head down and do all the work and it's interesting, just chatting to one or two other people on the podcast, um, male on Algeboria guy I coached and mm. in the States, he's playing MLR, played at the Eagles, played at Ealing. And he was saying, he's like, I stopped caring. He's he, And he's like, was trying to explain, like, don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. I still do. I, and I was like, mm. I get you, male on, I get you. But he was like, he just started playing so good. And Jimmy Goppard said something similar. He's like, you do all the hard work and then it's just go out and have fun. And it's it's yeah, it seems so weird. But when you stop caring, it actually kind of can allow you to then play well. Yeah. So what I, again, you're spot on. And what I what I tell myself, I'm not good at living it, but what I tell myself is once kickoff happens, all I can really be is a set of eyes to try and guide anything they can't see. Like, because again, you've done the work Monday to Friday. So they'll, they know I'll, I empty myself Monday to Friday to try and get us the most prepared we can be. They know I'm craving the weekends, but in my own head, I'm trying to deliver to myself that you just need to be a, a calm set of eyes and it's up to them. They're playing. You can't affect it anymore. Um, and again, I'm, some days I'm better, some days I'm worse. Yeah, it's, uh, it is difficult at the start when you start coaching, isn't it? You get, you're so invested, you're running up and down and the sideline, you're screaming and shouting. I've, again, I've, as I've progress through again club games you're so close you're almost like you want to run on and help like it's it's an interesting yeah. dynamic i went i did my first uh, australia had a do you remember the nrc competition it's like an itm cup equivalent it's like a shoot shield yeah oh uh, no the next step above that so after the, okay. the gap between super and club was an, a national rugby championship so it was elite players but played over 10 weeks or so Okay. That was my first semi-professional level role, but it was the first time I coached from a coaching box. Hmm. And that changed the dynamic for me completely. Like that's that small removal from the field helped me calm down so much. It's, it was really interesting. And what I've struggled with, and again, my role here has been on field and but my, my best for me personally, I perform best from the coach's box where I get that little bit of a, a sense of removal from the emotion of it and can be potentially on the laptop double checking things or that's my best. Again, it depends on the group. I did the junior wallabies for a couple of seasons and my best role was to be on the field and driving energy and, you know, speaking the language that they wanted to hear. But again, they're young and they don't know, they're not seeing things as quickly. So whatever's best for the team is most important. But for me, that sense of removal took some of the emotion out and allowed me to do better. 
Yeah, interesting. And I, I 100% think that too. Yeah, once a lot of coach, coaches should do it, even if you're not in a box. But um, where I am, there's a bank, you know, there's a mm. big bank. Beside it. That's what, exactly. I did that this season coaching UBC, like stand way at the back of the bank and it forces you yeah. to be analytical and to not be shouting on every thought that comes to your mind. Like pass That's it out, it. kick it, <laughs> face him behind. And it's like... <laughs> And I know as a player as well, when, when there's a coach shouting that, you're like, shut up, like, stop. I'm fucking trying. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the flip side of all the caring, though, is I reckon it's probably my best trait. Like, so I always juggle like, the balance between how much you care because it's been something that stood me so well and not caring. Like, I know you're saying, like, it's not that I don't care, but how do you remove that? Like, the balance of that's massive. Yeah, it's a tough one. And what do you think or how have you kind of progressed pretty quickly to, to where you are now? Like you say, yeah. you were working in a coffee shop, you got involved, have a look and, and things look to have happened really quickly. Yep. Again, uh, being an ex-professional, I'm sure that gave me a fast track and, and it's real hard, right? Because there's probably a, there's a layer of you haven't got the coaching experience and how skill acquisition, you haven't had to do the gritty bits to learn how to speak. And, um, if you can teach it to that group, you've learned all the problems and then teaching it to an elite group is easy. I did. I had a really fast track version of that. Like I did club under 20s. And while I was doing that, I, I got attached to it quickly. I did, I volunteered for everything I could get my hands on. So my, again, my start point was the scrum. I knew the scrum. I spoke to people who coached the scrum around positions I wasn't as sure about and some key metrics or language that maybe they would understand better than I knew. But I knew the scrum intently enough to go and coach it. And I offered every club in Canberra to come. I did women's rugby. I did, I did some kids sessions. I had a club Colts team going and I, all I was doing was honestly saying my words consistently and just building the framework that you could just adapt slightly to what the, the level you're at. But I, I was just developing my framework really quickly. Um, again, I was emotionally attached. So I was all energy. I had a sound understanding of how the scrum worked and I probably produced results quickly. So again, that, that gave me the opportunity. Then the club wanted me to do the first grade team the next year. And then I did that for a season. I was doing the Brumbies pathways. Again, I was doing just set piece. Again, I have any player would have a sound understanding. If you just put it in a framework, you give it enough detail, it's going to be better. But I was still doing the club game, still volunteering. And then uh, the NRC program popped up. And through the attack, my previous attachment to Brumby's got the opportunity to work with that group. And that, that went really well. And because of that, then got offered the opportunity to do apply for the junior wallaby position. Again, that went well. Then the Brumbies uh, were changing scrum coach. So I was brought in to do the super rugby scrum only. I hadn't, I already knew the coaching staff, but I knew how, what they were doing. So I was able to meld in there really quickly. I mean, it just kept, it, honestly, the same messaging, my how I viewed things, um, how hungry I was to learn, volunteer, listen. I'm not sure, but it just, it spiraled real quick. And I, I'm fully aware of how quickly it happened. But it, yeah, it was quick. I think this is my fifth year now. And yeah, I never would have thought I would be living here in Japan with my family, coaching professionally. Yeah, it wasn't on my radar. Yeah, and that's something I want to chat about there. But what before mm. we move on, what would be three kind of things, scrummaging tips or something that people could implement, or what kind of would be some things you'd say? I know it's interesting. I don't. I actually don't coach the scrum here, so it's it's been really refreshing because it's been my bread and butter for the first three, three and a half, four seasons. To be able to step back and just watch someone else coach it, you know, have watch one piece instead of the thousand pieces that move as part of it, it's been really good. Um, if you're coaching the scrum, a framework 
there's three things that are really important for the Scrum, I reckon. The setup, which is everything up to the bind sequence, is really, really important. Ryan, have I got you? Yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yep, yeah. I've got you. Um, so, yeah, sorry. The sequence up and to the bind, so what I call the setup, is massive. I reckon your ability at the point of contact to get down into the scrum and land in what I would call, you know, that perfect shape, like your ability to go from through the setup sequence, point of contact to finish in perfect shape. And the last thing is just your scrum conditioning. Like, can you stay there? Like, do you have an understanding of how to create pressure for long enough to deliver what you need to deliver? Um, I'm not into scrums being considered like dark arts and games of angles and games of, like the scrum is scientific. It is who can create more pressure forward. Um, and I've, yeah, a, a guy and who I played with spoke about the scrum like that and it was, ex it articulated exactly what I believed it was. It's eight guys in what, in what you, whatever way you consider it, they've got to be unison in delivering the most pressure forward at the same time. So how you do that, you again, I just I draw the perfect body shape and I say if eight of us look like this, you tell me how I can create more pressure than that exact shape right now. I say, and then I might give them just a representation. Like if my shoulders, this is my head, if my shoulders go to this position now, am I maximizing pressure forward anymore? Hopefully you understand. No, you're now wasting energy over the scrum. Perfect. Yeah. Good understanding. If I am like this. Am I maximizing pressure ground. forward? No, now you're sending pressure to the ground. Perfect. So the relationship between my shoulders and my hips, first and foremost, that's how I create and transfer the most pressure forward. Excellent. We're all on the same page. So eight of you fucking have to look like this. Let's not think of anything else to start with. Then you're establishing this set up, point of contact, and through the whole scrum. We're all on the same page. Perfect. Perfect. If we get that, we're fucking halfway there. And then I just build it from there. So then you go hips to knees. So everyone talks about, say, 90 degrees to, you know, overextension. And you just talk about squatting. Like, again, 110 is – so that's 90, 110, everyone. That's yeah. my strongest position in the squat. Yeah. And everyone understands that. Go, right, well, now at setup, your, your main outcome at setup is when you hit the point of contact – you want to be at your strongest position. So what does it have, where do you have to be at set up? Okay, maybe you've got to be flat through the back and at 90 at set up so that on point of contact, you land at 110. Yeah, so yeah, for the Almost, squat, yeah. it's, yeah. So like when you're squatting, it's you're, you're not at 90, you're just above that. It's that squat That's position it. of when you're just above 100%. So, again, all, all, it's so simple, but all I ever used to draw was that. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. And I'd say that if we get eight guys to set up in this position, like we're halfway there because we know on the point of contact, we're all going to just move into the scrum. And now we're at 110 on landing. Mm. And if eight of us do that, we believe, and we're, and we're square, we believe we are creating the most pressure will deal with like the nuances and how you achieve it and stuff. It's probably the elite end of it. But I still believe in that. Like I still believe if you can get eight guys to land in the position that you believe creates the most pressure, you've got every chance. Yeah. Then the and ball again, comes then we can talk about being outpowered. Uh, okay. The t and then it's just problem solving again. Like we want to be square. So if a tire head's going to be sideways, how does our system manage that issue, not how do we change it? What is important in our system through setup, point of contact, or thereafter to manage that change we're going to see? Yeah. And that's all that I ever makes... did. That's all yeah. I ever spoke about. No, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's brilliant. And, yeah, the eight people in unison is, without getting into any technical details, like eight people working together is, is one of the biggest things. And you can feel it when you're in, I, I played a lot of second row, a lot of yeah. eight, but when you're in second row, you can feel it when all the connections are right. 
and then it was just the problem solving. Like I never thought about, I always thought it was my responsibility as the front row. Oh, oh fuck, I've got to be fast. I've got to be the most physical, blah, blah. When I actually, it's the complete reverse. Like an error in the front row magnifies backwards. Mm. So oh, if yeah. you want to go forward, it should be like a hammer. Like the eight should hammer the lock, so hammer, and that's how you create that unison point of contact. So actually your front row, you want to be quick, but speed and power isn't your job. Your job is to be the platform with, with which all the pressure is transferred from behind you. Yeah. And that's how, I, again, I started seeing how I thought I could add value making the key points, making my important timeline and what I wanted to see. And I always brought it back to our setup, a point of contact and our ability to scrum long. And that's all I always spoke about. Yeah. And so you were doing that start and then you were semi-professional coach in the, yep. is it NPC you said? And then it was the national rugby championship, the NRC. National, NRC, sorry, NPC is in, mm. or, uh, New Zealand. But, um, so you're a semi pro so you're still probably working as well in the cafe and then yeah, the I was running the cafe running the cafe and then the opportunity then came was it with the Brumbies you became a full time yeah. coach? I did I did the super rugby scrum and I did the junior wallaby program for two seasons. Um, the junior wallaby program would be like intense two week camps. Yeah. Back to Brumbies. Uh, plus the cafe, then go away for a small competition, then to a junior world cup. I did that for two seasons. That's cool. And on the back, and on the back of that, got the offer to go full time with Brumbies, and and the role expanded. I did all the set piece. Cool. How did you find going in coaching the lineup then? Yeah, again, I was doing it. I was doing it for junior wallabies. I was doing it for a, a number of other programs. And again, I shadowed one of my. The thing that I know has stood me well is I'm. I will. I think imitation is flattery. I've looked at. I look at stuff constantly, and I go, "That's really good. How how could I make mine include that, or how could I steal that mm -hmm. one thing?" Um, and I've had real. I've had two incredible mentors at the Brumbies who I can still pick up the phone to today and talk footy with, in Dan McKellar and and, and Laurie Fisher. Like I watched the two of them. I was coached by both of them. I was able to coach with both of them. So I've had I've had a real strong soundboard in how to coach coach that part of the game. Yeah, it's a couple of things on that is I've heard <laughs> as well, like there's no new ideas. There's and... definitely not. And I reckon the game trends are coming back. What's old, it gets new again. And that's I reckon yeah. that's happening at the moment. Yeah, and you see that as well with I see with back set piece moves and they talk about a uh, contiformity at Leinster. I saw that, you know, there's things that have been done in the 2000s have been done again. And, yeah. you know, it, it also, it's kind of cycles. There is, there's a number of things that are always going to ring true, but the game cycles, like defenses were, defense became a huge talking point in the game. Like you can't, there's no yeah. space. There's no, so the referees helped out and they started blowing the whistle like you've never seen before. And all of a sudden, Teams were doing something else, and that opened up attacking. Then 50-22 rules have been tried, introduced, and the trends of the game will always cycle, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And how have you found moving to Japan? I had never been here, had no language, uh, had a strong something in my waters, always wanted to come here. Had no, no reason why, other than I knew I wanted to come here at some point, even to holiday and have loved it since the day I got off the plane. What have you enjoyed about it? I've picked up it? a heap of language. The rugby's fantastic. The lifestyle's fantastic. People are amazing. It's it's a beautiful part of the world. <clears throat> and we're very lucky. Like we're, we're situated here with Black Rams. It's just on the edge of Tokyo. Uh, we're blessed. Like We're in the city, but we're not in the city. We've got parks. We've got everything. It's, it's really amazing. And how have you found picking up a bit of the language? The language is good. Like I ripped in, I took lessons. I did a weekly lesson for as long as I could up until the in-season became hard. Um, I found them really helpful initially, but then, again, just picking up, oh, I'm too busy to learn grammar this week. And I, what I started doing, I started writing down words. I'd be like, I say... 
more speed. I might say to the hooker, I need more speed. I might say it to him three times a day. And I was like, what if I just learned, if I write that down and just go, I need to learn how to say, I need more speed. Can you tell me how to say that to him? And I eventually, we, I, I'd go into my lesson and I'd have a Rolodex of things I wanted to learn. Look, I do the attack breakdown. And I said, I want to know how to say, start on the ground. Uh, like use both hands or which, which side. Like I just wanted all these quick buzzwords I could try and coach more in Japanese when it was required. And I, and I did, and I, I made it my point to like write down 10 things and try and have them and use them as religiously as I could to coach. Uh, and you pick, you pick it up quickly. Again, it's just repetition. Like I, I was attached to it. I wanted to learn. And I, the thing they love the most is someone who, if they have a go, they'll try and speak the language. Mm. And they'll never knock you. They actually, all they ever do is, is just fix if it's said wrong or if you're closed. They love it. Yeah, fair play. And I, I'd say that. And it, help, it helps like a little translator, uh, Yuka. She's amazing. She's a little pixie. She runs behind me around the field. So if I ever get stuck, she helps. <laughs> As she runs runs around with you. Yeah, she hides behind me. Like we might be 15 v 15 <clears throat> running around and she just tucks in behind me in case we ever get too <laughs> close to the player or anything. That's gas. Yeah, it's honestly, and it's such a learning curve. Like you're in a meeting. And you might have a, look, it's COVID. We want to be in and out of here in 15 minutes if we can. But I'm going, fuck, I've got to deliver a week's information here. So, but then my my 15 minutes is seven minutes of English because it's got to be translated. Mm. <clears throat> so the whole process, you got to, your bang for your buck's got to be spot on. Yeah. Uh, it's got to resonate well. I tried to learn Japanese, but if it was ever time to, <clears throat> be staunch on something I believed in. I always went back to English because I, I wanted to make sure they knew, they, I wanted them to feel me, like how I'm feeling naturally about it. Yeah. <clears throat> and I had that, info, I, again, I was told to be like that when I got here. Yeah. And one thing I want to go back on there. So mm-hmm. I coach backs and attack now. And with the attack, something I'm just looking at in the off season is, the attack and breakdown like you say and it's definitely you know we, everyone talks about green or fast ball and the speed of the ball and it's something that i've just reviewed and tape just really been looking at and trying to think about how we'll speed it up for next year but anything on that that has helped you again i reckon i had a great conversation with someone i'm just trying to remember and it, it's important but the idea of quick ball is brilliant we want to play with tempo but if your quick ball isn't capturing anyone at the ruck or isn't changing the defensive line all you're doing is banging fast into a brick wall Mm. so i think if the sole metric is just tempo it's probably not enough information depending on what level you're talking about Because we can, we can, again, like I'll tell you, so we have the quick, this season in top of, we had the quickest B zone ruck speed. Yeah, it's, uh, you there? It's yeah, yeah, I'm there. Yeah, no, with them, Sorry, I yeah. see what you mean. Yeah, I see what you mean with defenses. If, if they just put one in the ruck and they, that person rolls out and they're not committing, um, but yeah, so what you're saying is that if someone is clearing out, they I suppose stop the fold, or you want to be bringing in defenders as well to be creating mismatches so, in the defensive line to stop them. The normal, say the normal process, you've got a ball carries with two support players, so you're committing three to a breakdown. Ideally, what you'd like to leave with is at least the tackler, one defensive player, and potentially if you could get. Ideally, you want to lose three for three. That would be the ideal world. Mm. So the idea of ruck speed being we commit three, but really they've got a tackler, no one committed, and the tackler's getting back on his feet. They've got 15 to our 12 now. Yeah, yeah. So your quick ruck speed, what's it? it's, it's only achieving tempo. It's not actually shortening the line, changing the attack picture. 
So as a, as a sole metric to chasing ball speed, maybe not the right thing. It's definitely important because you've got to play with that tempo. But like, how accurate are you two in the ruck, or are you like, are you get are you capturing bodies? Is the tackler being caught in the breakdown? Are you capturing the threat every time, et cetera? There's more. To, there's probably layers of complexity to it depending on what you're looking for. Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks for your time. Just a couple more things, but. What was the best day in your career, if you could relive one day? Playing career? Yeah, playing. Um, best day playing. Uh, my Listen, my last year at Brums, we lost a Super Rugby semi-final. We lost to the Tars in Sydney, and they, they beat the Crusaders the following week. Um, but the week before, those those last two or three weeks that I learned how to play hooker because of an injury crisis, and all of a sudden was playing a quarterfinal and a Super Rugby semi final at hooker at the SC, not at the SCG. It was called. It's just been rebuilt. I think it's Allianz Park. It's like beautiful. It's fucking packed. It was about fifty thousand people. It was Brumbies Tars. It was massive. We lost, but I just remember at the end of the game, I was so distraught because that was Brumby's finish, but just being like, like, this is what all the work was for. Like, probably that realisation that I was, the decision to potentially move, like it was a bit of a gratification knowing that I was going to Ulster. I had a good new contract to go to, a new opportunity. Probably in a in a dark moment was probably quite a, a good moment in terms of... Mm having achieved something. Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. And what advice would you give, say, an 18-year-old, someone in their last year of high school, say an Aussie kid who is playing in their school team and they're mad keen on rugby? Well, that if they're mad keen on rugby, that's, that's definitely the most thing because, again, the attachment to the game and wanting to learn the game, uh, learn your position, definitely it's, it'll serve that kid well. Like, I, Not that you have to be obsessed by the game, but you've got to love the intricacies of the game. Like if you're just a turn up, tick the box, it's not going to be enough. Like you get found out quickly. I'll tell you what's interesting for young kids, and you may see it, like a kid's ability to, not kids, shouldn't call them that, like young men's ability to communicate is really poor. Um, most of it's because of the iPhone. Like everything's done that by that medium now. So like we actually, I've seen it at the Brums, I've seen it through Junior Wallabies. It's disgusting here. Some of it's because of language barriers, but they cannot communicate well as a skill anymore. It's a, it's a, like a lost art. So a kid's ability to speak, and he only has to be able to speak rugby, would be able to communicate the game and talk while moving. That's massive. Like I would, any kid who thinks he could commentate and learn the game while playing is a massive skill. I reckon, I reckon everyone speaks about, you know, why do you play rugby? What's your why? Again, that, that's important. But what we find a lot of kids is everyone knows what they're bad at. Like I'm, I'm a really good ball carrier, but I can't tackle. Oh, I've got to work on my tackling to become an elite player. And that's true. But you're an, you're an elite candidate because you're an awesome ball carrier. And the balance, again, like how much do you coach a weapon versus trying to develop, you know, that weakness in someone. Like the game's got to have points of difference. Like you've got a number eight who genuinely breaks the line, dominates game line, causes chaos, but struggles with repeat effort. You can mould a game to someone with that point of difference. For sure. But that that kid could be lost to a system chasing, becoming a better defender and having better repeat effort. So knowing a kid's weapon and making sure that we develop weapons. And also, again, we're trying to produce marginal gains and a hundred different things because we make them a better footballer slowly. That's that's better. But like those elite candidates have weapons. Let's make sure... That their weapons are weapons. They've got points of difference. Let's let's make sure we create like we're chasing them. 
Yeah, hundred percent. It's a brilliant point you make, and it's uh, yeah, just to never lose sight of what you're good at ever, and it's it's so no. easy to, like you say, it's so it's so easy, easy to say to, he'd be great if he could tackle. Yeah, like you just uh, so many players came to my mind when you were talking. There it was like Ron O'Gara, kick like just kicking and but just wasn't a great tackler, or you know, just this. <laughs> So many players that you can pick any player and be like, he isn't the best at that, but he's phenomenal at this. Yeah. Mm. And la- lastly, what? How far forward do you look like with your own career, and is it something that you're kind of in all in on now for the next, I don't know, ten, twenty years? Uh, again, like I'm not naive, but professional sport is hard. It's probably. It's outcomes based, so we'll have to have success in whatever capacity that looks like to the club or to enter the company here, or you know, there's got to be whatever that if that's growth, we're a young group. If we're putting in systems, establishing a culture, and that can be that's deemed a success here, or if it's just we've got to win football games, there's an outcome res- response to that definitely. Um, do I look forward? No, I'll tell you what I've always done is I like when I look at things like I remember watching the Reds win a Super Rugby title and being like, I want to do that. And then obviously wasn't able to make it happen, but seeing things, not being envious of things, but seeing people achieve things, well, I'd like to do that. So mm. I don't know what that looks like yet. Like we've got a strong attachment to Ireland. It would be amazing to be able to go to Ireland again and do this as a career. Whether that happens or not, no idea. <clears throat> well, like right now, my best focus is I want to stay here and make this group. It's it's a really exciting group we've got. The the like the possibilities are endless if we get things right. If they if we can get them to attach to what we want to produce, um, I want to be around to do that. Like to live in Japan, potentially have my daughter start school in a Japanese school. I just think as a life experience, what we're gaining while able to, while able to do football at the moment is just incredible. Yeah, awesome. I can only imagine. Yeah, I've also mm. looked at Japan as well and just thought like such a cool place and like because there's such a rugby culture there and there's like the the top div, the second div. There's so much rugby. There is a lot of rugby. The schools game is massive. The university game is even bigger. There's a there's a rugby community here ready to explode. Yeah, and it's it is. You can see like a, they're essentially now are they a tier one nation or more or less? I don't know whether it's yep. by name or they are. Yeah, it's they definitely there. are. Yeah. yeah, exciting times over there. All right, thanks a mil for your time, Rory. Been a no, no problem at all. Really enjoyed it. No problem at all.